Welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Monday, December 17th. She's a boss, and a boss does um, what exactly what Tony Preckwinkle is doing here. In the race for Chicago mayor, one candidate drops his petition challenge of another while others fight on. Chicago's future is at stake. I'm really Susanna Mendoza is here to talk about her battle to become Chicago's next mayor. Here I get to do the market analysis with my own products right here with me. I can talk to the customers. Small Chicago businesses are beginning to pop up under a new city ordinance aimed at encouraging and regulating the trendy concept. The recent Marriott Hotel data breach affected half a billion people. Who's behind the attack and what can we learn from it? So, oh, yay, I like, completed everything on time, but I actually didn't. The process to get financial aid from the federal government is getting longer for thousands of college students. A new book dives into writer Hunter S. Thompson's crusade against the political establishment. And we have your thoughts about Mayor Emanuel's plan to fix the city's underfunded public employee pensions. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brandis Friedman. Three Chicago police officers will be waiting longer than anticipated to learn their fate. Amanda Venicky has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Amanda. A verdict in the bench trial of the three police officers accused of helping cover up Laquan McDonald's 2014 shooting will not come Wednesday after all. When closing arguments wrapped up December 6th, Cook County Judge Dominica Stevenson said she'd announce her decision then. There will be a hearing Wednesday. Stevenson may reveal then when a verdict will come. The reason for the postponement is unclear. Chicago police officer Thomas Gaffney and former officers Joseph Walsh and David March are accused of conspiracy, official misconduct and falsifying reports. Officer Jason Van Dyke was found guilty in October of second degree murder. He shot McDonald 16 times. Van Dyke will be sentenced January 18th. More on this story on the Chicago Tonight website. Chicago hits a milestone and grows the police force by 1,000. The CPD says the figure does take into account vacancies and retirements. It has added more than 2,000 officers as called for in a 2017 that is, expansion plan. Mayor Rahm Emanuel says the recruits don't know the CPD culture of the past and so represent a fresh start. And the most fundamental way I would see that, we're not asking you just to police and patrol a neighborhood. We're asking you to be an exemplary pillar and a part of the community. That's a different way of looking at things. That's going to ask more of each and every one of you. You're more than a police officer. You're a role model. The new recruits will each get body cameras, tasers, and be trained on the difference between mental health and crime calls. The CPD says half of its officers now self-identify as minorities. Illinois will not accept Michigan's offer of $8 million to help keep Asian carp out of the Great Lakes. The Army Corps of Engineers' plan to prevent the invasive fish from reaching the Great Lakes calls for re-engineering a lock and dam in Will County. It's up to Illinois to take the lead. Michigan's governor recently offered to make a down payment, but Illinois Governor Bruce Rauner, whose term ends next month, isn't biting. The administration has been wary of the controversial project. In a letter, he asks Michigan's governor to instead use the money on other protective measures like fishing for carp. Illinois' incoming governor hasn't taken a stance. A spokeswoman says J.B. Pritzker believes in protecting the Great Lakes marine habitat. There's also more on this story on our website. And as for the weather, clear tonight with a low of 24 degrees. Tomorrow, sunny and a high near 45. And don't forget, you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also watch via podcast and the PBS video app. And now, Brandis, back to you. Amanda, thank you. 
Election officials and campaigns are in a frenzy to sort out who exactly will be on the mayoral ballot in February. Today, one candidate withdraws his challenge against another, while several other cases drag on. Paris Schutz keeps us up to date. Paris, what's the latest? Brandis, there's a beehive activity of activity down at the Board of Elections at 69 West Washington, and this is going to continue well into the new year as these ballot challenges get sorted out. So today, Paul Vallis announced that he's dropping his challenge of candidate Gary McCarthy, stating that we shouldn't take it to mean he thinks McCarthy's petitions are solid. He just thinks it's going to cost too much money to go on with this challenge. And late last week, Jerry Joyce dropped his challenge of Bill Daley. So that narrows down the list of notables who are under challenge right now to Dorothy Brown, LaShawn Ford, Jamal Green, Lori Lightfoot, and Susana Mendoza, and it means these candidates, Chico, Daly, Enya, Fioretti, Joyce, McCarthy, Prequinkle, Vallis, Wilson, stand a really good shot of making it to the ballot. They have a clear path right now, and Lightfoot is one of the candidates being challenged by Tony Prequinkle. Today she said she filed a motion to dismiss this challenge, alleging Prequinkle's forces are engaging in bad faith practices, including trying to claim that blank lines are actually invalid petition signatures. They've also objected to pages in our submission that don't even exist. We submitted about 3,400 pages. They've objected to 999 uh, pages, which don't exist. So none of that says they've actually done diligence and care and bring an objection. What it does says is that Tony Preckwinkle is doing what a party boss does. Preckwinkle, who is also challenging Mendoza and Dorothy Brown, reiterated her claim that this is all about following the rules to become mayor. There's a process for getting on the ballot. You have to have 12,500 signatures. The rules are the same for everybody. Everybody has to meet that bar. Uh, we made a number of challenges and they're in process. It is going to cost, apparently, the board of, uh, Chicago Board of Elections nearly a million dollars, not just obviously your challenge, but all the challenges. Is that just too much money? Is that a waste of money? You know, elections are very expensive. Would you argue that it's better to have authoritarian governments which don't cost anything. That was Marianne Ahern of NBC5 asking that question about the cost of these challenges. Now, this case uh, with Lightfoot, the challenge of Lightfoot will be heard on Thursday. Also in the challenge of uh, Susanna Mendoza, and you'll hear more about this in a second, that will also have another hearing on Thursday. And Paris, Tony Preckwinkle has also had to answer for questions about her ties to Alderman Ed Burke. How did she answer those questions? Well, here are her ties. She had a fundraiser thrown this year by Ed Burke as part of her campaign for re-election as county board chairman. Lightfoot has called on her to return that money, and here is how Preckwinkle answered that call. You know, uh, we're considering what our response will be at the moment. Uh, chairman Burke is under investigation, and that's where it stands. He's simply under investigation. Burke, who she mentioned, is under federal investigation, also received some heat late last week from the city's former aviation commissioner, spelling out in a memo she gave to the Sun-Times some of the instances where she felt Burke had pressured her unduly on some contracts at O'Hare Airport. And today, Mayor Emanuel had a question for Evans. Where were these allegations earlier? If you were in a place and you saw things and uh, felt things that were not legally correct or ethically correct, you had a responsibility to report them. And if you didn't, you abdicated your responsibility. So former Commissioner Evans mentioned pressure on one contract in general, that is for janitorial services at O'Hare uh, by a company called United Service Companies. That company reported a $1,500 donation to Ed Burke's campaign today, or Burke's campaign reported that donation on their uh, election page today. Well, let's keep an eye on Paris. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And now to Carol Marine and a conversation with one of those high-profile candidates for mayor, Carol. Brandis, thank you. Just days after being re-elected, the state's controller, Susana Mendoza, announced her candidacy for Chicago mayor. Not a huge surprise after a mayoral campaign video accidentally leaked before Election Day. Mendoza originally won that statewide office in the 2016 special election to fill out the remaining two years of the late controller Judy Bartopinka's term. Before that, she was the first woman elected Chicago City Clerk and served from 2011 to 2016. Mendoza started her career in politics when she was elected and sworn in to the Illinois House in 2001 at the age of 28. She represented the first district on 20, until 2011. She's now among 21 candidates for mayor and is considered to be among the top contenders, as you said, Brandis. Susana Mendoza joins us right now. You know, 
In years past, you were not averse to the idea of petition challenges. You even signed off on one. So, so why the protest about these? Sure, look, I think pretty much most people who have run for office at some point or another have done one-off objections to petitions. And there is a place uh, in our system for valid petition challenges. But what we're seeing today, Carol, is completely unprecedented. You have the highest ranking woman of color who's in charge of the Cook County Democratic Party, who frankly should be setting an example of greater access for women in today's age, Trump America, you know, the year of the woman, but instead chose to only challenge the petitions of women of color, five of us. I'm not the only one, five women of color. Willie I Wilson think that's shameful. challenges the petitions of men of color. I mean, isn't this the sort of thing where you, you try to knock off the people you think most threaten you? I think it should be about access to democracy. I mean, what is she afraid of? Why, why challenge five women of color and no one else? I mean, is she afraid that democracy will erupt in Chicago and Chicagoans will have a choice of who their next mayor should be? Like, Chicago's mayor should not be picked by self-coronation. This should be a democracy. I think it's not very progressive or democratic, frankly, to go only go after women of color. You should be actually working to elect more women of color and actually opening it up to the ideas of other women. I'm so excited. So this is just a women's issue? I, I think it, women's issues are important issues because we've been trying to lay the claim that when women are elected to positions of higher authority, things are going to change for families, for children. We're going to we see things through so a different So women are prism. better than men in being elected? I don't think we have enough women in elected office, and I think that's a fact, right? And I've been working very hard, as you know, over the last few years trying to encourage more women to step up and run for office. I didn't challenge a single other candidate's petitions, even though, of course, I would have some resources to do that. But I think that wasting a million dollars of taxpayer funds on frivolous challenges is not the right way to go. Most importantly, here's the deal. I'm going to be on the ballot. She knows it. I know it. And Chicagoans will have a choice of who their next mayor should be. And I hope that there's another four women who will also be on that ballot okay. that they can choose from. Next month, you're going to be sworn in as Illinois controller at the same time that you're campaigning for Chicago mayor. Why shouldn't voters feel played? Well, number one, there's multiple candidates who are in that same position, right? We've got a state representative who's running at the same time that he was reelected. We have the county president who's also just Let me just revise that. Why shouldn't in, right? all voters feel played when an elected official goes through one election to run for another with the chance that whether they win or lose, they can always fall back on the other elected office. Well, number one, it depends on what kind of elected official and how good you are at your job. And I'm very proud to be the Illinois State Controller. I've worked very hard to you know, manage the state through the worst fiscal crisis, and I've done a good job of that, not by myself with an amazing team, but on behalf of the people of Illinois. And this is just about timing. It wouldn't have been my preference that it happened this way, but certainly none of us knew that Mayor Emanuel was going to step aside, and I had a commitment to the people of Illinois that I would continue to stand up to Bruce Rauner and his failed policies, and had he gotten reelected, there's no way I would have run for mayor, but he didn't, and now it's part of the past, and I'm focused on the future of Chicago, and that's why I ran, Carol. So how do you do your controller job and aggressively run for mayor? I do it well. I think that but women... How? how? Well, I stay in touch constantly with my office. I go to the office. I, I was in Springfield just a couple days ago. I'll be there again over a couple times over the next few weeks. I'm still traveling the state. Uh, we know how to get things done as women. We do it every day. We know how to multitask. Women, frankly, have to know how to chew gum, walk, and blow bubbles at the same and time. And I'm two pretty offices. good at it. It had, I'm not the first one to do it. You know what? The boys have done it in the past, Carol. That's how Mayor Daly got elected but to But you don't want to fall to back on, on that. Mayor, I, I think that why, why should we have a different um, bar that we have to abide by than the men? I think that I present the best qualifications and the best opportunity for a bright future for Chicago. And I think I can be of even greater service. And here's one last thing I want to say about that. I love the state of Illinois. And we're going to have for the first time a mayor of Chicago who actually loves and respects the rest of the state and will work hard to not just make Chicago the greatest state, city in the state, but actually have the rest of the, the state understand that we have a mayor who wants to be helpful to the needs of the entire state. Is that a criticism of Rahm Emanuel? I think it's a criticism of every mayor who's ever served Chicago, that no one has really had a real pulse on what the rest of the state looks like. And we are stronger when we lift all of each other up. Next November, as mayor of Chicago, I'll be in Cairo, Illinois, the way I have been over the last few years. 
trying to work with Mayor, Mayor Coleman, not just with immediate things that we can do for his constituents, but with the Rolodex that the mayor of Chicago can have to make sure that businesses go to Cairo instead of St. Louis or neighboring states. That's what we can do as a mayor of Chicago for the rest of the state of Illinois. If you are elected, would you keep Eddie Johnson as superintendent? Look, here's what I'm going to say. That's a huge policy uh, in terms of a personnel decision. I think it would be irresponsible right now when I'm not elected yet, when I'm just talking about my vision for the city to talk about or announce uh, personnel decisions. I'm going to surround myself by the best and the brightest. And whoever my superintendent is, whether it's uh, Superintendent Johnson or someone else, is going to have to abide by my belief in the need to restore the police department, the trust between the police and the, and the community, to understand that there is a code of silence, that we have to get rid of it, because here's, here's the deal, crime doesn't have a, a color and neither does a code of silence. They're both wrong and we have to bridge that gap. But and the, so how will you negotiate yeah. with the police union given your belief that there is a code of silence well, if you are elected mayor. As the mayor, that will be my job. And I think that I understand um, police issues perhaps from a different prism than other candidates. You know, I was a little girl who, uh, when I was in Little Village at the age of seven and before that, when I was walking to school, I felt like violence followed me like a shadow, Carol. My brother's also a police officer, and so I see it from both sides of the equation. And I think that we're going to have an opportunity to elect a mayor who understands that people that live in crime-infested neighborhoods don't want to have to hate the police. We want to be able to depend on the police. We want them to serve and protect us. And at the same time, the police officers deserve our respect when they put on that uniform and go and lay their life on the line for people that they haven't even met. We can get to a place where we once again see police officers as friends, but police officers also have to learn to treat people of the city with the respect that they deserve. I'm gonna work on that. Does Alderman Ed Burke now under federal scrutiny need to be stripped of his control of the $100 million workers' compensation program? So here's what I think, that he should step down as the chairman of the finance committee. Um, the workers' compensation program, again, truthfully, I think we need to be deliberative and thoughtful as to where is the best place to house that. Is it in the law department? Is it in the committee with a different chairman? Um, I don't think any mayoral candidate knows that system well enough to make it a knee-jerk reaction on a program that deals with the $100 million of t taxpayer money. Here's what I will say. If it does make sense to do that as mayor, I will do that. The but Inspector I, I General has weighed in on that, as you know. And so the idea that it's in the Finance Committee when there's a confusion of the separation of powers, is that the appropriate place really? Do we need to study that? I do think we need to study that, which is exactly my point. I don't know that any of us mayoral candidates have enough information at our disposal right now to say exactly where it should go and how that should run. What I have said very clearly is that it's time for new leadership there. And even with that, if that were to happen today, for example, when I become mayor, I will look at that and decide where is the best place to house it. You actually should be happy that I'm not saying, yes, give the mayor more power by moving it into the mayor's control. I think we need to look at where's the best place, be transparent with the public as to why it's going to be housed in a certain department or keep it there, whatever that may be. But, you, you know, we, we've got to get to the decision, but we do need a change, and I've been on the record about that. You referred to Ed Burke as your mentor. In what way? In, in politics, in the sense that he represented a large part of my legislative district when I first got started. And, you know, I respect people, who, I, I should say, I respect the, the fact that when I was first getting started as a politician, I had to rely on the advice and work with politicians of many different districts. Um, I like certain things that I admire in people. Number one, his choice in spouses, right? Ann Burke is one of the biggest role models I've ever had in my lifetime, and I think for many people, and what she's done for children with disabilities and the Special Olympics and so many other things are, are things that I'll always admire and want to actually strive to be like. So it's not just an issue of, let's say, admiring certain things about elected officials. It's, it's really the fact that I got my start representing the near southwest side of the city. He was one of many elected officials who I had to work with and learn things from. But I try to focus on learning good things, not the bad things, Carol. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not Ed Burke's candidate, so that should tell you something about where our relationship stands today. He's endorsed Gary Chico, would you, not me. Would you keep Janice Jackson as CPS CEO, or is that going to wait, too, as a decision? I think a responsible mayoral candidate should not be announcing changes to important positions just...
to pander votes. Here's what I'm going to say about Janice Jackson. As I travel the city and talk to parents and teachers, um, they seem to like her quite a bit. Uh, I will be meeting with Janice Jackson at some point to ask her how her vision coincides with mine for how to make sure that we're investing in our children, we're moving CPS forward. But again, a, a personnel issue of that magnitude is going to have to wait until I'm the mayor of the city of Chicago. But I'll be sharing all that information with, with, with Chicagoans as we make them. The $10 billion bond deal for pensions that Mayor Emanuel has proposed, where are you on that? So again, I don't have enough specific information. But you're the controller. You I understand money. Yeah, you know perfectly. bonds. So this is something you should have done some homework on, right? No, I have, Carol. So here's what I was going to say about that. To your point about me being the controller, I think there's one person that can speak to this issue. It's me. I've just managed to stay through the worst fiscal crisis in its history, championed a bond deal that, as you know, is saving taxpayers 4 to $6 billion. But I think the biggest issue with the $10 billion bond deal is I don't know how Mayor Emanuel is structuring it. None of that information has been shared with the public. As mayor, uh, the one thing that I think is key, whether it's a $10 billion bond deal or a version of that, is to walk the constituents of this city through what the ramifications of that would be. Not just what happens if we do it, but what happens if we don't do it, and what happens if it's a combination thereof. We're going to need revenue to deal with pensions. Uh, we're going to have potentially a progressive income tax on the books. We're going to, I'm going to fight for a casino in Chicago. We're likely going to have marijuana revenue coming into the city of Chicago. I know how to fight in Springfield and navigate the system to bring revenue to Chicago. But at the end of the day, if we decide that a bond deal is worthwhile doing, I'm going to involve Chicagoans from a transparency perspective early on, not when I'm asking the city council to vote for the deal. Rick Simon of United Maintenance is a lightning rod for controversy. You know that. I he, do now, that's for sure. Well, he's been for, for an, a lot of years. So 2016, he gives you a $1,000 contribution. Mm -hmm. You just return it now in the midst of the Burke controversy. Why now? So number one, I don't know Rick Simon. So let me just be clear about that. that that $1,000, we talked about it, I think, when I was here in a debate during the Bruce Rauner, Leslie Munger fight. And that was a, an issue that Bruce Rauner had made and demanded that I return at that time. And I wasn't going to be bullied into returning a contribution from an individual I had no connection to that was unsolicited to begin with. Um, now it has been brought to my attention, really, truly, like some information that I was completely unaware about him. I've returned, not returned it, I've actually donated the $1,000 to the Times Up Legal Defense Fund, of which I believe in, you know, dealing with issues of sexual harassment. But it's a done deal. I think the bigger issue here is that, you know, there's still a lot of, you know, interesting, I think it's important to point that the organization that is kind of beating me up for not having returned that contribution until now is the same organization that had no problem endorsing me in the last election, but is now working to support Tony Preckwinkle. So this is just a politically motivated hit. I'm happy to Let's donate talk the money about another to another contribution. Cause, then that's where we're at. Your yeah. single largest contribution is hundred thousand dollars from General Iron. Now, that company has been in the EPA's crosshairs. That is a lot of money. Why take that amid the controversy that's going on about remediating their site? Well, number one, I am fully in support of Alderman Hopkins' uh, quest to make sure that they close their operations. And I'm not in favor, by the way, of relocating them to the southeast side to continue polluting other parts of the city. So let me just be clear that you can contribute to my campaign, but at no time does that make me beholden to you or anyone else other than the people of Chicago. So I'm on the record, there you have it. An individual that just sent me a $100,000 contribution cannot buy my vote, and I will be supporting 100%, and always have been actually, Alderman Hopkins' proposal to close those types of facilities and make sure that our children are breathing cleaner air. So today is your seventh anniversary. What are you going to do tonight? Hopefully get some dinner with my amazing husband, who I've maybe seen for two seconds all day today. So, so you can leave us now then, and we thank yes. you for joining thank us. Thank you, thank you. You can find links to our interviews with other candidates for mayor on our website. There is much more on Chicago Tonight. Stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the City Club of Chicago. Smart people may disagree about what makes a great city. But part of what makes Chicago great is that we don't have to agree. To run a city like ours, a lot of issues come up. 
The City Club of Chicago is a place to debate those issues and hear from the men and women who shape the policies, lead the industries, and tell the stories that define our city. For the free and open exchange of ideas, the City Club of Chicago. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, taking, talking a look, excuse me, taking a look at how to better protect yourself against the next data breach. One reason why university financial aid offices are so busy right now. A new book details Hunter S. Thompson's fight against fascism during a pivotal period for the Gonzo journalist. And in viewer feedback, your strong reaction on both sides to the mayor's idea to change the Illinois Constitution to address pension underfunding. But first, starting a small business these days can be a daunting undertaking. Developing a strong business plan, securing funding, and offering a product or service that people will want are hurt hurdles that often stop a budding entrepreneur before they can get very far. And that's where pop-up businesses can be one way to get started. The concept has been around for a while, but as of this month, the city of Chicago is requiring pop-ups be licensed. Eddie Arusa shows us a few that are already open for business. John C. Dodge is steadily making a name for himself in the field of pogonotrophy. Over the last five years, he's created dozens of products that carry the name J&L Pogonotrophics. And if that long word is foreign to you, John's facial hair offers a clue. Pogonotrophics, which means it's great for beard care. Unhappy with what he was finding on the market, Dodge began creating his own products in his kitchen. But up until now, he's been selling his rapidly expanding line only at neighborhood festivals, a couple of barber shops, and online. Earlier this month, however, Dodge moved into a literal brick and mortar store in the Andersonville neighborhood. It's a retail space that used to house a video store. The building's owner has remodeled it, and while she awaits a permanent tenant, she offered the storefront to her friend, the Poganotrifer, for at least a month. If you're a jewelry maker, a soap maker, a pottery maker, and you want to get it out there to the public, now it's easier than ever to try and do that in Chicago. That's because the city of Chicago has begun a new initiative to encourage pop-up businesses like John's to sell their wares wherever a retail landlord might offer them space. We think that the millennials and technology and the experience that customers are looking for in, in how they shop really is driving this change. Pop-up businesses have been popping up throughout the city for years, but they've largely come and gone under the city's radar. No longer. The business community was indicating that this was something that they would like the city to, to license. The goal for us is to ensure safety, consumer protections along the way, and really to ensure that there is an even level or a level playing field for, businesses, for the business community. This past summer, the Chicago City Council passed an ordinance requiring pop-ups to get licensed. It went into effect on December 3rd. To obtain a license, pop-up wannabes now have to provide the Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection with some basic tax information and not have any outstanding fines with the city. Entrepreneurs can get anything from a five-day to a full-year license, ranging in price from $25 to $150, and pop up in several different locations if they want. They can determine, hey, where is my product being sold? Who, what customer base do I re is really kind of my customer base? And then they can make a decision whether they want to really get into a long-term lease. And this is where we allow vendors to pop up on a daily basis. For a number of years, pop-ups have drawn Bronzeville shoppers to this space on South King Drive. It's a storefront leased by entrepreneur Kenya Renee Reeves, who sells her own line of bath and beauty products called Absolutely Anything Essential. But occasionally, she opens up her unused space to serve as an incubator of sorts for other budding entrepreneurs. Reeves says the new licensing requirement will likely cut back on the number of pop-ups she hosts, but overall, she supports the idea. For the entrepreneur, it creates a more, you being more professional, so that's a pro. Um, and the con, is, it's really no con, it's just maybe a little bit different than what they're used to, just popping up anywhere and just doing whatever you want to do. It's a little bit more a professional avenue that you must take now. Another pop-up incubator in the Chatham neighborhood became the first to be officially licensed under the city's new initiative. It's called The Woodlawn, and it's the brainchild of businessman Donnell Digby. 
Digby opened the space last year to try to nurture a number of business concepts. Located on a corridor of 79th Street where vacancies outnumber occupancies, Digby hopes the Woodlawn helps bring back opportunity and vitality to the neighborhood. If we can hedge creativity, opportunity, innovation in our neighborhoods, that's when we create impact and growth. The city insists the new ordinance is not intended as just one more revenue generating measure, but rather as a safeguard against unprofessional business practices and to encourage experimentation in a new era of retail sales. During his first couple of weeks as a brick and mortar business, John Dodge says his foot traffic has been good. And while he doesn't know what he'll do after his license expires, he says shoppers may help him decide. Here I get to do the market analysis with my own products right here with me. I can talk to the customers, ask those important questions like what are you looking for in a business? And that's a key lesson for any pop-up business person. The customer is always right. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Eddie Arusa. Pop-ups operating without a license could face fines from $200 to $1,000. You can learn more about the city's pop-up initiative on our website. There's quite a bit of data breach fatigue hitting people across the globe. This month alone saw reports of three attacks on major companies, including a recent breach at the Marriott hotel chain. That one affected an estimated 500 million people. As we move more and more of our accounts, shopping and communication online, how do we better protect ourselves against what seems to be an endless game of cat and mouse? Joining us to discuss some of the recent breaches and what companies and people can do to safeguard their data is Blaze Err, an assistant professor of computer science at the University of Chicago. Welcome back to Chicago Tonight. Thank you for having me again. Absolutely. So who and what was affected by the Marriott data breach? Right. So we can start with what was affected. Um, basically, um, about 500 million entries and databases were stolen, and this included things that have have become almost like the standard data breach, like your name, your date of birth, your address, your credit card, your password, those sorts of things. But this had some, some extra um, entries thrown in, things like you know where you were staying at a, a Starwood property, um, for instance, maybe your passport number. And so, so this is a particularly scary breach, both in the magnitude as well as in the data that was taken. So some people believe that the culprit behind that attack was China's main intelligence agency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of people are pointing fingers at China. Um, nothing is certain at this point. Um, there are two, two big reasons why people are pointing their fingers at China. Um, the first is that the methods used are similar to things that have been seen before um, in basically data breaches orchestrated um, by the Chinese state. Um, and the second thing is, uh, the second reason is that this data has not yet shown up on the dark web or on hacker forums, as often happens in data breaches. And so essentially, whoever took it is um, keeping it safe and using it potentially at, uh, for, at some future date. What are some of the things that companies can do to better safeguard their data? And could Marriott have been doing some of those things? Right, yeah. So, I mean, one of the um, main things companies can do to better safeguard their data is not to have the data in the first place. That is, are they thinking about, do we really need to be keeping this data around in perpetuity? Um, could we actually just get rid of this from time to time? Um, and you know, so that's one big part of it. Another part of it is making sure that they're using up-to-date uh, computer security practices. So essentially, the, a lot of the details matter a lot in, for instance, how they store their passwords, making sure sure that they update their software. So if um, we might recall the Equifax breach last year, that was another one of the big ones that hit everyone, right? And in that case, it was basically Equifax, like many individuals, forgot to update their software. That essentially, they had old versions of software running, and that's how the Equifax data was stolen last year. And so late last week, more than 6 million Facebook users' photos were compromised. What happened there? Right. So what happened there was that um, there was a bug in the way, and basically the back-end software on Facebook. So for about 6 million people, photos they had uploaded but not yet posted, for instance, on their timeline, um, could have been um, exfiltrated. And in this case, so far, it doesn't seem like um, basically any hackers discovered this bug before Facebook did. So this is actually um, a very different thing than, for instance, the Marriott data breach, where with Marriott, it's pretty, it seems pretty certain that this data was actually taken. Facebook, um, that data wasn't necessarily taken. It's the equivalent of basically you know, coming home after vacation, realizing you never locked your door, um, and you're looking around and say, well, nothing seems gone. Maybe, maybe, maybe we, uh, we escaped uh, this mistake. And that would be, is that how you would describe the difference then between a bug and a breach? Yeah, uh, I'd, I'd say it's, uh, that's a pretty good way to describe it. Okay. Um, so Facebook is facing a very big fine um, 
that's in compliance with the EU's data protection regulations. Right. What is that regulation? Right, so in the European Union, the GDPR, or General Data Protection Regulation, um, basically speci it's, think of it as a privacy act for all of the European Union. So it gives um, consumers, for instance, the right to access their data, the right to be forgotten, um, as well as basically the right to be notified in a timely manner about data breaches. So according to the GDPR, European citizens have to be notified within 72 hours. And that's actually very different um, than what happens in the U.S., um, where basically in the U.S. there's not a federal data breach law. It's each state has their own data breach law. And so, for instance, in Illinois, um, the data breach law says, well, they have to be notified uh, as soon as possible, but it doesn't really give um, a, a particular date or a timeline for this. Um, and in addition, uh, the U.S. data breach laws, the consequences aren't very dire. It's small amounts of money, whereas with the European Union GDPR, it can be up to 4% of the company's annual turnover. So it's really meaningful money that's at stake. And in this case, it sounds like Facebook did not follow that law and, and make the notification within the 72-hour window. Correct. Okay, so that means they could be facing potentially, yeah. And uh, there's a lot of discussion about how Marriott is actually potentially also um, at risk for not complying with the GDPR. Um, so not only a bug on Facebook, but more than 50 million people were affected by this bug on Google Plus. Right. This is the second time that social media has taken this kind of hit. Right, yeah, so, so the, the Google Plus bug, what happened there was that um, there was basically data that um, is normally private in your profile potentially could have been accessed by developers um, basically using the software that connects to Google Plus. And similar to Facebook, there th don't seem to be as many signs that anything was actually taken. That was just, you know, people were, you know, Google Plus was vulnerable. The, the door was unlocked, but uh, nothing seems to have been, have been taken. Um, so the breach at Google Plus, it wasn't the only tech news last week. Also, uh, the Google CEO testified before Congress. What was revealed there? Right. So, so um, basically, you know, when the Google CEO went in front of Congress, um, basically he was questioned um, at length about a number of things, everything from the company's privacy practices to the data collection practices, basically to their corporate competition practices. Right. And so um, as a consumer, um, one of the things I was glad to see our elected representatives um, emphasizing over and over was just how much data Google has about us. There's the data that we give to it willingly with um, typing searches into Google in the search engine. There's the emails we have in our Gmail. There's our location data from our Android phones. Um, and then there's also essentially data Google collects about our web browsing. So we're going to all different web pages, not just on Google.com, all over the web. And they're tracking um, basically that we've been to all of these places so they can make inferences about what we might be interested in to show us more relevant advertising. Right? So the upside is we get more interesting and relevant advertisements, right? but now Google has all this information about us. Sometimes they um, even know more about us than we know about ourselves. Um, and there was also, I think, a, a bit of a distraction from some of this. There were some other questions that got attention from some of the representatives. Right, right. So, I mean, there, there were some questions about um, asking Google about the iPhone, which, of course, is not made by Google and stuff like that. And so those are the things that make the news, right? But and a little bit covers up the fact that there are these really concerning societal questions about how we value our privacy and, you know, how, you know what data we really want to give to companies or to other entities. Yeah, you said that if you could describe that testimony in one word it would be the word scary. scary absolutely scary why right you know just it's a, it's a moment for reflection about how much data companies have about us so it's essentially you know, we hear you know week after week data breach data breach data breach right and then when we think about what data is in there it's really it's our person it's you know basically our address it's our date of birth it's our browsing habits it's our credit card information it's our social security number sometimes sometimes it's our passport sometimes it's you know where we've traveled right and it's it's a very scary time we live in um, where we just see the data flying all all around and we have no idea how they're using it absolutely um, so for us common folk what can we do uh, to protect ourselves from a data breach mm -hmm. Right, there are a couple of things that we can all do proactively. Um, one of the main ones is to not use the same password in more than one place. Right? And so that seems kind of like crazy, right? Because we have, we're asked to make passwords for hundreds of different accounts. So how could we possibly have 100 different passwords? Right? And unless you're a memory champion, you probably can't remember them all. So um, use a password manager. Let the password manager generate your passwords for you. It'll make different ones in each place. Right? And then you just have to remember, for instance, one password. And so I highly recommend that. Um, I highly recommend for uh, accounts you really care about enabling two-factor authentication. That is the little code on your phone you have to type in addition to your password to log in. 
Um, another um, thing to do is to basically um, freeze your credit. Um, it used to cost money to do that, now it's free. Right? And one of the most important things is to just say, do I have to give data to the company? You know, can I just avoid being in a database in the first place? Maybe I should not click save this information for later. Maybe I should just leave a form field blank. All right, Blazer, thank you so much for joining us and for giving those tips. Uh, you can read more of Blazer's tips on cybersecurity on our website. And though finals are over for most college students and winter break has begun, many of them still have something looming over their heads, financial aid. It's a rolling process for students to complete the documents needed to be eligible for federal financial aid. And this year, university officials say it's gotten harder for a lot more students as the federal government works to ensure that aid goes to students who need it the most. You have to submit the transcripts from the IRS with that worksheet. In the financial aid office at the University of Illinois at Chicago, it's getting complicated. This is like my third time here. <laughs> Senior Eunice Del Angel is back in the office to complete her FAFSA forms. FAFSA, short for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. And this year, it's causing a headache because so many more students are being flagged for income verification. So now I have to come back um, Monday um, and bring in my parents' like residency or um, proof of it, uh, like resi proof of residency. There you go. In fact, a lot of students are here for the same reason. It's part of the U.S. Department of Education's income verification process. That department is required to verify income for 30 percent of applicants. The intent is to make sure that the federal Pell Grant program goes to students who actually need financial help. But this year, some universities are saying more of their students are being verified than in the past. University financial aid officers don't know the criteria for selection, but it means students have to come back with a lot of paperwork. We have to um, verify the uh, adjusted gross income that they provided on the FAFSA. Um, we also have to verify their household size and any other forms of untaxed income that they might receive. The first step could be as simple as logging onto a computer and linking an IRS account with a FAFSA account. There's a lot of reasons why families cannot use a data retrieval tool. If that's the case, they have to go directly to the IRS to receive a transcript. University officials say they don't know why their numbers have spiked this year. For example, at UIC, of the 45,000 students who applied for admission, about 5,000 of them were selected for income verification last school year. This year, about the same number of students applied, but verifications went from 5,000 to 9,000. UIC Financial Aid Director Keeley Fletcher says the increased load takes more time to process. It would typically take us about two to three weeks. For uh, one student? For one student. This past year, it took us six, four to six weeks. And at National Lewis University in downtown Chicago, not all students can wait it out. Here, the number of students flagged for verification went from 30% of first-time freshmen to 75%. Gustavo Garcia is a sophomore, but was flagged too. I was more frustrated than surprised. I was like, oh, this again, because like, I've done it two times. While he hopes to be done with his process soon, he has friends who couldn't finish and therefore had to drop the semester. She needed her FAFSA stuff, and her dad was in Mexico, and he couldn't give her all the information, so she was like, basically, they dropped her. Really? Yeah, and that was a big deal. National Lewis says about 11% of its undergrads have had to drop out related to being selected for FAFSA verification. It's the low-income students who are typically eligible for these Pell Grants, and that's what they're being flagged for verification on, is their access to these Pell Grants. Uh, so it does feel um, like an like a unfair burden. University officials say the increased verification efforts haven't resulted in many changes in which students receive aid or how much they get. I think that the Department of Education has every right to ensure there's not fraud going on when they're giving out grants to individuals. But the fact is we know that 95% of the cases end up being uh, completely accurate. So you've made 95% of these potential students jump through so many hoops, many of them then just give up because it's too much and it's, or it's very intimidating. In a recent speech, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos sounded an alarm on the federal government's student lending practices. She cites federal student aid holds one and a half trillion dollars in outstanding loans, burying students in debt and costing taxpayers. 
the federal government must become a more responsible lender. Congress must recognize and be honest about the unmistakable implications of its favored programs on students, on taxpayers, and on rising costs. But it's not certain if DeVos's warning is the reason for the increased verifications. But university officials say the Department of Ed has heard their complaints and is working to improve the process. We're not going to ever change the economic and social trajectory for families coming from underserved backgrounds if we just keep throwing obstacles in their path. And just late last week, the U.S. Department of Education said it would forgive $150 million in federal student loans as part of an Obama-era rule to help students indebted from now-closed schools. On Friday, the Department of Ed began notifying 15,000 students that their loans would be automatically erased. And now to Paris Schutz and the author of a new book about a well-known counterculture figure, Paris. From the mid-1960s to the mid-70s, Hunter S. Thompson established himself as a countercultural icon. During those years, Thompson followed the Hells Angels biker gang. He witnessed the tumult of Chicago's 1968 Democratic National Convention and covered the 1972 presidential campaigns of Richard Nixon and George McGovern. Thompson's writing defined the gonzo journalism genre. A new book called Freak Kingdom, Hunter S. Thompson's manic 10-year crusade against American fascism examines this pivotal period for Thompson, drawing parallels to the political events of today. And joining us is the book's author, Timothy Denevi, an assistant professor at George Mason University's Master of Fine Arts program. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me on. First of all, why a book about Hunter S. Thompson right now at this particular political moment in time? Well, I think with the events of the last two years, it can be really overwhelming to consume the news every day, to be caught up in the cycles that we have every day, to be engaging over and over again the um, trauma and dramatic situations that we have every day. So as a reader, I think it's very nice to go back to the mid-60s and early 70s and to realize that this all happened before, and it happened in a very, very dramatic manner. So this book, um, Hunter Thompson's um, Political Evolution, for me, it's really important because what, what it does is it shows us how somebody can go through the tumult of the times that we feel like we're facing now and come out of it with a really lovely and important perspective on America as a whole, which is where he ended up in his political evolution. And one of the things you try to do in this book is kind of dispel the, the popular culture image of Hunter Thompson, all the drugs and, and the gonzo journalism. So what did you discover about him that might be counter to what the popular myth is. He was a serious, hardworking journalist, um, working the way that uh, we expect um, objective freelance journalists to work for the first 10 years of his career. And it wasn't until that he learned all the rules of journalism that he began to break them with his more um, formally inventive style that we identify him with in Rolling Stone. But along the way, as a um, hardworking journalist, he was present for many of the seminal moments of the 20th century. And, and you talk about in the beginning of the book that he, he had this really uh, fear uh, of, of impending fascism. Where did that, almost a paranoia, where did that come from? Well, he had just been, before he returned to the United States in 1963 in South America, reporting for the National Observer. And he had written articles like, democracy dies in Peru, but no one can do anything about it. And he had seen how easily um, ostensible democracies could be taken over through populist or um, nationalistic movements. So when he returned to the United States, and John F. Kennedy was killed, um, he, he, was, he was deeply worried because he felt that Barry Goldwater, the Republican uh, ostensible nominee at that time, could then bring a nationalistic movement and bring a more extreme movement to the mainstream. You know, and he was at the, Thompson was at the Cow Palace in 1964 when Barry Goldwater said, um, extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. And all around Thompson, the delegates began to angrily pound their chairs and to shout out in this very violent manner. Thompson, looking around, realized how quickly the United States could devolve into a place of violence and political retribution. And you mentioned that, uh, that once he learned the tenets of journalism, he broke all the rules. So define gonzo journalism for us. You know, he, he defined it as subjectivity. Um, he defined it as a form of instant journalism, where the writer goes and reports on a um, specific event or moment and doesn't necessarily um, edit it up or put in the objective lens that we often identify with journalism. Why did he believe that that was a better form of journalism, at least for, for himself? When Thompson looked around and he saw how easily the most powerful people like Richard uh, Daly or 
Richard, I'm sorry, Mayor, Mayor Daley or Richard Nixon could manipulate the idea of objectivity. If Nixon knows that the um, press has to file a story each day and be objective about those stories, Nixon can give them false information and make sure that false information gets out and gives a meretricious version of Nixon to the public. That got Nixon elected by more than 20 points after the Watergate break-in was known about. So Thompson saw that and said, perhaps it's better to approach this in a subjective manner and to articulate where he comes from, Thompson, and then articulate how that allows him to see the reptilian nature of someone like Richard Nixon. Famously, he, he came from a place of fear and loathing, and, and that fear and loathing, he felt, was, was largely for Richard Nixon. Why was Nixon sort of the subject of his, his obsession? You know, he'd been following Nixon since um, the checkers debate in the 1950s, and in 1963, when um, Kennedy was killed, and in one of his letters, he said, this opens the door for someone like Richard Nixon to come back into the American um, political arena. And Lo so, and behold, he did. And in 1964, Richard Nixon introduced Barry Goldwater at the convention. And Thompson realized then, and he had realized before that, everybody in that audience knew that Richard Nixon was lying to them. He's like, I'm just the poor son of a butcher. I'm this, I'm that. I don't have any um, you know, higher uh, ambitions. And Thompson understood that one of the scariest things in American politics is when a politician lies, the audience knows he's lying, and they support him anyway because they see that lying as a form of ambition. Talk about his view of Mayor Richard J. Daley. He talked about the 1968 convention. He was really distraught at what he saw there and, and really could not stand Daley. I mean, the problem with the 1968 uh, Democratic Convention, one of the many problems for Thompson was that this was state-sanctioned violence being used specifically to silence dissent to silence journalists and to silence political operatives within the uh, Democratic Party. It wasn't just the very famous riot at um, Michigan and Balbo at which Tucker Thompson was present and was beaten over the head uh, with, by a billy club. It's also that later in that, um, later in that convention, the political, um, the political nominee, um, Eugene McCarthy, had his offices attacked and you know, had his staffers beaten. And when we begin to use violence in America against journalists and against um, other political um, opponents, and we do it through state sanctioned sources, we're very close to, um, or have already crossed over, that line between the democracy we know and a fascistic society. And, and we fast forward to the current day when you see the, the fights between the president and the press and, and all the, the talk of fake news. What do you believe Hunter S. Thompson would say about President Trump and, and the current state we're in? You know, I, I think he would see him in the way that he saw Nixon as a would-be tyrant. But most of all, I think Thompson would comment on the way that President Trump uses and manipulates the media to um, dominate the news cycle, to make the media complicit in his um, atrocious and undemocratic approach to the presidency. Just in the way a hurricane is the main news um, for CNN for days at a time, Trump has realized that he can become that constant hurricane that will never end and will always be what the news is. Um, anchors and agencies want to and have to cover. Hunter S. Thompson is also famous for, for, for being a drug user and, and being a big consumer of alcohol. Were the drugs recreational or was it just a part of what he saw his job was? He, he needed the drugs to do his job. I mean, his son, um, Juan Thompson, wrote a beautiful book, uh, Stories I Tell Myself, about his father's alcoholism. And Thompson was a, was a very bad alcoholic. He found early on that um, a drug called dexedrine, which is similar to Adderall, could be used to recover more quickly to um, sustain himself while reporting, to write longer than he'd like to write. So it was more of a performance sustainer that allowed him not to make the hard choices of drinking less and leading a healthier lifestyle. And later, when um, it was much harder for him to write, he did be become, in a sense, the caricature that um, we identify with now. But those first years of his um, journalistic career, which coincided with some of the most important years in American history, he was right there giving us a clear um, literary voice on what was going on. And then one of, one of the anecdotes in your book, he actually ran for public office. He ran for the sheriff of Pitkin County, where he lived near Aspen. Tell us about that. You know, he returned from Chicago um, and seeing Mayor Daley beat up um, legitimate um, political protesters and opponents. And he said that he couldn't stop crying for two weeks, that he just completely was weeping at the state of democracy. And he, he didn't know what to do if large-scale protest, not large-scale nonviolent protest wouldn't work in our country. What if a large-scale protest, nobody's listening, nobody cares? What if the people in power refuse to even acknowledge your right to speak? So he decided that the best way for him to affect change in the American uh, polity was to do it on a local level, on a small scale level. And he didn't win that race. No, but he was able to advocate a, a platform in Aspen of um, uh, economic um, sustainability, a platform um, of civil rights, um, and a, especially a platform against greed and development that the city would take up um, in the next few years and sort of stave off the transformation of, of uh, Aspen into 
the resort community that it's become now. All right, Timothy Denevi, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. All right, and the book is called, once again, Freak Kingdom, Hunter S. Thompson's Manic Ten-Year Crusade Against American Fascism. You can read an excerpt on our website. And we're back with more in a moment, so please stick around. Before we go, some viewer feedback. Mayor Emanuel recently laid out his prescription for shoring up the city's underfunded public employee pensions, including his call to change the state constitution. Here's what some of you have to say. Time and time again, the Illinois Supreme Court has rejected various plans to revise the pensions. When are we going to just give up trying to get out of the promises made and raise taxes to levels necessary to pay these obligations? Why shouldn't changes be made to public sector pensions? Changes are made all the time in the private sector. This is the real world, not the fantasy world that government workers live in. Another worker, another viewer writes, now that you are leaving, you want the current workers to suffer. You'll be collecting your pension and grandfathered in. We must reform pensions. Times have dramatically changed since schemes were put in place. End cost of living adjustment now. Interesting that in the 70s and 80s, when the inflation rate hit 12%, a 3% COLA was acceptable. But today, when the inflation rate is actually close to 3%, a 3% COLA is outrageous. 3% is the historical average. It all evens out. And as always, we appreciate hearing from you. Join the discussion on Facebook and Twitter or post your comments on our website. And that's our show for this Monday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And join us tomorrow night live at 7. Obamacare takes a hit in Texas. What does it mean and what else could change? And a peek at a private collection of dazzling vintage cars. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices. Bob Clifford is on the board of overseers of the Rand Institute for Civil Justice, a think tank in California.